Um, Jack, you want to? All right. Um, so welcome, everybody. Uh, new year, new room. Uh, we have a couple of guest speakers who I will um, have introduced themselves in just a minute as we go around the table. Um, but wanted to um, uh, just say a couple of things just to get things going, and then I, I want to spend uh, the bulk of the time we will be uh, going through presentations uh, by May and Glenn. Um, we have, uh, we do have a number of speakers set up through the beginning of the year, and we are working on, we're still working on another large quarterly uh, session that, did we wind up changing the dates? Or are we keeping the dates? No, I know we think postponed we, it indefinitely. Yeah, okay. but we'll, we'll be All right, so we are working day. on that uh, presentation that will focus on uh, our efforts here, but across the university and our partner institutions as well, to move forward on positioning ourselves for NCI designation. So we are we, we are certainly heading on there. We do have um, I, uh, we we have a list of other speakers that are set up coming soon, and regularly when we put out the agenda for these, we will also put out we will also put out our current list. So um, I, I, one more announcement that I I, I want to make, and we won't have time to discuss it today, but uh, next time when we come back, we will have more opportunity to um, to discuss it, and that is. Normally, starting in January, we have a graduate course called Team Science and Collaboration. Um, be, because of low enrollment this year, we have decided that what we're going to do is we're going to, we are going to be um, canceling that formal course, but we're going to be using that time primarily internally to do some professional development, but from time to time, we'll make available some of the things that we're going to be covering uh, and that time slot, it's a two hour time slot on Friday morning or uh, uh, Friday morning for things that, that other people may want to participate in. For example, we are talking right now, and it's not nailed down, but we're talking right now about spending some time learning some of the software related to social network analysis. Um, and we're going to plug in some other tools like that that people in the past have said they're interested in learning. And we're going to spend some time uh, just focusing on that. And we probably can, can't accommodate a huge number of people, but we would like to offer some of these to people that regularly participate in this. You will see on today's agenda an announcement that the end of February, February 27th, um, we have uh, uh, Susan Schmidt uh, and uh, Vic Garcia will be uh, presenting on their work that sort of crosses some of the things that Susan is doing with her Center for Population Health at, Z at Xavier, but also Vic Garcia, who many of you know uh, from Children's Hospital, uh, has been working to develop uh, much more neighborhood integration about really sort of changing the, the environment uh, to improve health in general. So those two will be speaking the end of February. Uh, any other announcements that I've forgotten? Laura, can you? That, not that I can think of offhand. Okay. Is anyone um, like in our group applying for any of the community partner or community connection? I have okay. not heard. What is that, dead, what is that deadline for the grant? Or is that that okay. It's not an expensive effort. Okay. okay. There was somebody from the community who was interested in partnering with somebody, oh, and we gave her a couple of names, but I don't know if anyone followed up on that. Um, or did it I'll check on that. Um, <coughs> I know, and, and I know we have not generally, we, we've tried to keep up on uh, RFAs that are available, and I, I have seen I, across my desk a couple more from Pfizer have come come through, um, but we will, again, sort of remind people that we have, that we collect those and we have them available if people are interested applying, we'll certainly help. Um, so 
Uh, we are going to, we're continuing to keep up on grant opportunities, internal and external, uh, and we will continue to offer various uh, resources, workshops, and other things around particular, uh, around particular resources. So um, I will, um, we'll start by introducing everybody and then we'll get started um, with uh, today's presentation, which I, I think is going to be fascinating. So uh, I'm Jack Keyes. I'm an Associate Dean for Continuous Professional Development and the Director of the Center for Improvement Science. Um, and we'll go around this way. Laura? Uh, Laura Hildreth, I'm Director for CIS. Uh, I'm Mei Chang, Library Chief Technology Officer. I'm Angela Mandel, a Program Manager for CIS. Hi, I'm Sonny Reagan, I'm the Lab Research Division Director in Family Medicine. Susan Tyler, I'm the Director of Continuing Medical Education. I'm Tammy Mensel, Assistant Director for UC Cancer Institute, Cancer Center. Oh. Right. And you were centered before anyway. We were very good at yesterday's meeting. We scratched the eye off of all of those and, and made them with a C. 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 So C. you really C. Got to be more careful. I do. And I'm uh, Glenn Horton. I am the head of the library's application development unit. Okay. And who do we have on the phone? Sharon. 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 Sorry, I think we got two people at once there. Um, uh, we got Stephanie. Stephanie, are you there? Yes, um, Stephanie Shukman. We're echoing, I think. Um, Thank you. Stephanie Shukman. Oh, okay. Stephanie, I work with uh, the CIS team there as well with CCTSC. Okay, thank you. Sonia? Hi, it's Sonia. Hi, it's Sonia. 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 I think your computer sound is on, Sonia. Okay. I'm with the um, center, the Evaluation Services Center. And uh, Sue? Susan Schmidt, uh, Sue, from Xavier University, Population Health. We're looking, Thank you. Victor and I are looking to the uh, February 7th discussion. We're going to have to work on this Excellent. echo situation. Is there anyone else on the line? Yes, this is Ruby Crawford Hemphill, um, the Assistant Chief Nursing Officer at University of Cincinnati Medical Center. Fantastic. I'm sorry, Ruby Crawford, what's your last name? Hemphill, H-E-M-P-H-I-L-L. Great, thank you. Welcome. Uh -huh. Thank you. What's the problem with the echo? So if they are listening to their computer and you have your computer on, yeah, it just keeps going back and forth. But we don't have a mic on our computer. No, but if they just call in with their phone and they use their computer, then it's Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, we'll put that in the next uh, instructions. Technology instructions. Okay. So um, to start off this uh, presentation, a, a little bit more about um, Scala. Um, uh, Scala started years ago before. My time, and um, uh, the university never had a way to collect and preserve the scholarly output. I mean, all these are great big terms, but all the publications you guys do, all the research at the university, it goes to publishers. If the publishers go away, what happens to all the output? So libraries around the U.S. and around the world, um, especially at university, we try to. Um, uh, uh, collect and preserve them because this is this UC stuff, right? So um, this is what we've been trying to do, and we, uh, the library set up this repository to collect this uh, collect articles and then to preserve them, um, not necessarily with our central IT storage, but what we call um, there's a, a, a organization we go with called AP Trust. That means that 20 years from now, your grandchildren comes along and say, where's this article? We'll find it for you. That's right. And it's, it's needed because publishers come and go, mergers, acquisitions, okay. and some just go off and what happened to all of that, right? Okay. Little, uh, because this is the College of Medicine, uh, we'll touch a little bit about PubMed National Library where it's mandated. Right? So there's a little slight difference. And um, so very broadly, this is what we've been trying to do to preserve the permanent intellectual output for discoverability and access 
perpetuated over time. So in it, we have got things like uh, electronic thesis and dissertations from folks on that side. What happens, all of that. Um, if we go to the next one, what, what do we have? Does, does this include sort of the gray literature? Uh, um, you, you know, here, um, people think of PubMed is is the entire universe. We, I, I, if we just sort of have that in our head, and and it really is a slice of the entire literature, and and we our skill sets most for most of our faculty somewhat limited, so we we typically don't go beyond that. But I I certainly have a, a sense now that we're doing more inter, interdisciplinary stuff that we're losing a lot. So it would be it would be good to know there's another place that captures a broader right right um, a PubMed is where uh, you submit your articles it's peer reviewed and it gets published uh, and that is accessible by the world it is ongoing current research whatever you, you guys could and if you have got a grant from the uh, NLM from NIH you're expected to submit it there uh, sometimes you also submit articles to an Ohio Journal of Family Medicine. Mm -hmm. That may not be in PubMed, okay. And even if it is, if you want to make it open source and provide it to us, and we will keep it, okay. So we, mm -hmm. we submit to that website. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we'll, we'll run through some things. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, we're obviously like, getting ahead of ourselves. No, I'm no, sorry. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, PubMed on this campus actually represents a huge chunk of publications from um, and, uh, UC. I think the next one is probably engineering, arts and sciences. So they will have their you know, uh, places that they publish in. You can also provide us a copy to keep in perpetuity. Okay. Uh, this, uh, as long as it doesn't violate you know, your publisher's copyright and all of those. And that's a question that mm -hmm. everybody will ask. Yes. Uh, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. so okay. All right. Um, sometimes uh, it depends on which publisher you go to. They will say, if you have put your stuff elsewhere, we cannot publish. Oh, Some publishers right, do right, that, right? right? Sometimes the publisher says, we have published this, we hold the rights for two years, for example. Okay. And you cannot put it anywhere else. Okay. So, that is, so it, there are all these vari variations in, in, that, um, uh, in, in the whole scope of, the, uh, of publications. We do have a scholarly communication librarian who is like top notch in copyright issues. So you can always contact us, we'll say, you know, yay, nay, help you through that process. Um, there is a research uh, data services team. On this side, it is uh, Amy, no, not Amy, uh, Tiffany Grant over in... Uh, we know Tiffany. Yes. She, she's part of this support services for this. Um, the, uh, what we're also trying to do uh, you know, in this whole movement is also something called open access. Because publishers are saying you must pay us. You guys publish for free. Uh, we have to subscribe gazillions of dollars to, to, re, to get your article. So the whole student environment, it, it, it is crazy, yeah. right? the whole model. So we're trying to say, uh, you know, uh, our repositories are always open access. Mm -hmm. Students can come in and get the stuff. So that's why we're encouraging uh, publish, uh, uh, faculty who publish to make it available open access. Okay. Yeah. It's, a, it's still an uphill battle because so publishers won't get their revenue. After, um, like, say, two years mm -hmm. of stuff, and that publisher mm -hmm. says you can mm -hmm. publish it, but mm -hmm. they were closed, mm -hmm. we can now open, open it. Okay. Yes, yeah. which means then you can open it and uh, send a publication, send your article to a different publication. Mm -hmm. You can give it to us in perpetuity. We will keep it. And, and we'll talk about automatic ways okay. Okay. to do that and, okay. and, and stop. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So let's go so straight into it. The, and the, the, the big takeaway from from this slide here is the fact that a uh, scholar. Is, is really trying to cover two main things, uh, providing access to the content and also preserving it. When libraries collect either digitized content or born digital content, it's usually one, one or, or, or both of those um, uh, goals are in place. So, and with scholars, we, we, we do both of them. So uh, it's put out on the web so anybody in the world can access the content but also it's being preserved so that years down the road the content is there. Scholar itself might not be there. We'll, we'll probably be on different software. Right. Um, so it's kind of an, it's, it's an interesting uh, dynamic. You know, we have the software and we have the content. The content is there forever, but the software is always changing. changing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then it would be up to you to update it and move it over. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we've we've done that a couple of times 
already. It's always been Scholar EC, but the core code has been highly revamped over time. Okay. So um, as far as content goes, uh, as, as, as May said, we're, we're, we're trying to capture the scholarly output of, of, of UC. So uh, papers, presentations, uh, research that people have, uh, data sets, things like that can go into Scholar. And the main goal there is to get this content off of people's hard drives where, number one, no one else can access it, and number two, it might get accidentally deleted, corrupted, <coughs> and, and be lost. So Scholar is kind of a safe place to, to, to uh, put this stuff. And Scholar is also a self-submission repository, which means that uh, faculty and staff can go straight there, put their stuff in, and it is instantly available to the world. There's no mediation process involved where we have to approve it. Uh, there were concerns in the early days about what might get put in there, uh, but we haven't really run into any any problems. Um, so, uh, and even students can actually go in, into Scholar and add content, but we ask that they work with an advisor if they're going to do that, if they're maybe dealing with a, a capstone project or a thesis or something like that. Um, but they can put stuff in under their own account if they want to. So when we say put stuff into Scholar, it is uh, preservation implies it's done. It's not meant to be there and then a bunch of you get in and edit and change and discuss. That is more for uh, Office 365, you mm -hmm. use Teams, you use your SharePoint, you use your Google Drive, your Dropbox to work on documents. It's, after it's done, you know, put your laurel on it and then it goes in there as a preservation copy. Yeah, okay. consider it published. Yes, yes consider it done. So yes. say you have a presentation mm -hmm. and then a year from now or whatever, they mm -hmm. decide they want to publish it. Mm -hmm. Is that okay to do? Do you think the presentation out can take the publisher with you? Doesn't matter. Okay. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But if it's a presentation like today's presentation, I wouldn't put it inside there because right, it's, right, it's right. an ongoing like thing. Yes. Yes. yes, conference papers, right. all of those, yeah. And conference papers is already, you've presented it. It is a done deal and you can put it up there. Your next presentation is probably a revamp of something else, right? Okay. You can still go back there, pull it out of archive and rework it for a different presentation, save it, and then the next conference proceeding, you present it and then it's in perpetuity. So are you accepting like PowerPoint? Yes, yeah, we, we, do, we, we do get those in there, but mm -hmm. we also get like, let's say someone had a, um, uh, it could be in PDF format, okay. or uh, mm -hmm. uh, there are a number of, of uh, poster presentations that are put into an, right. into Scholar mm -hmm. as as just a, a large image or something okay. like that. Right. So it's, so it's mm -hmm. easy for right. someone mm -hmm. to pull. Mm -hmm. This is just all kinds of lights are going off in my head <laughs> um, for 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 lots of reasons. Do, do you, so I, I I you know you you guys just by the very nature of your training. You don't just dump things in. You have a cataloging process. Is mm -hmm. that part of your presentation? No, it, that is not the way that Scholar works. Given the Scholar is self-submission, we don't have our catalogers get in and organize. But, okay, so, but what goes in, so if I were to just, would, would you, if I just decided, I had done a presentation, I did a number of presentations last week, I, I just wanted to, dump my presentation into this. Um, what does translate dump for me? First upload it. Uh, so you will log in, yes. ID password, you say you want to upload. Okay. A file. And then the, the, the system will then ask you title, author, subject, you know, the standard, what we call the metadata, the record. And yes, yes. So, so you do, so you have a, an, an and, and submitter-driven yes. cataloging yes. process. Yes. 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 That's what I want. That's what I want to know. What do I have to yeah. tell you, or what what will I be able to find out about mm -hmm. something that I come across in here? Right. Mm -hmm. so how yeah. searchable? Is we'll, it? We'll, we'll show examples. Okay. Of that. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, we always try to put the demo stuff up front because people start to try to have a hard time wrapping their heads yeah, yeah. around it. So, um, but once you have a couple of slides, we'll, 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 all right, we okay. We'll, 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 all right, yeah. yeah. So um, uh, as May mentioned, open access content is encouraged. Although we do have a few different visibility options, which we will touch on. And did you say everything you wanted to say about mm -hmm. the mandated yeah content? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then just to give you an idea of how much content we have in Scholar. Um, it went. Sorry, one more thing. Yeah. Uh, why we put exception mandated trusted repositories? 
PubMed, um, uh, National Library of Medicine, NIH, they, there is a federal mandate that if you have a grant, you have to submit. And National Library of Medicine has got more resources than you see. They have got the you know, uh, budget line for servers and storage. So uh, from our part, we say that is a trusted repository. It's not, you know, John Doe down the road Correct. doing this. Right. So that's why we're saying PubMed is important. All your stuff there is important. <laughs> but it's already being stored, backed up, dark storage by, the, by federal. Okay. We can feel okay that we don't have to also duplicate that. You are because not duplicating. We are not duplicating that. Okay. But if it's something like Ohio Journal of Family Medicine, mm -hmm. if it's not in the National Library and in that, yes. then they can put it to us. Okay. So again, it's up to you guys. Uh, you know, uh, if you want to put, if you have got stuff in PubMed and you also want to put it here, we're not stopping it. Oh, but okay. by and large, we are not going to go into PubMed and say, let's pull out everything from UC and push into Scholar mm -hmm. because it's very trusted. Mm -hmm. They they spend like a gazillion dollars on on preserving that stuff. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's say preprints like the physics preprint, and if you're a physics uh, in the physics college. There's a preprint. It's a subject, uh, subject special uh, repository. They have got the stuff there. It's a trusted repository. So if you want to put it with us, that's fine. But we wouldn't, uh, you know, actively say, put it there. Also, put, give it to us because we're duplicating. Okay. It's about cost issue as well. Okay. I, I, I'm working really hard not to keep jumping in, but I just, I, I have a lot of stuff oh, okay. going on in my okay. head. Now, keep it in my head. Yeah. Yeah. I'll keep it in my head. So let's yeah. just All take right. note the next <laughs> yeah. So when we get yeah. to that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. To the back so, of the page. <laughs> so the, um, in, in 2018, about two years ago, we had about 6,000 individual files in Scholar. And then you see there was a really big jump um, a year after that. Uh, during 2018, we worked directly with some uh, uh, content submitters who had large amounts of content to kind of dump their stuff into Scholar. So while it is a self-submission repository, if someone has a really large amount of content and they want some assistance with getting it into Scholar, we can help kind of do like a, a batch load into the, into the system. So we worked on that, and then uh, as of uh, this month, we've got about 35,000 individual files in, in Scholar. Okay. Uh, I think it maybe comes out to a little over two terabytes uh, of content. Okay, so. Um, actually looking at Scholar now. Um, I'm just going to give you kind of an example of, of the types of things we have within the repository and then we'll look at like a submission page uh, so you can see that process as well. So if you go to scholar.uc.edu, you can browse or you can search around for content. And uh, here uh, we see a search results page where I have uh, pulled up some images limited it to the Global Marine Biodiversity Archive, uh, which is photos from uh, uh, David Meyer, who uh, was here at UC. And you can see we get a little bit of, of metadata on this screen, enough to kind of see if it's something you're interested in. And then you can click in on one of these images to, um, uh, to see additional detail. Now, before I, I show you the, the actual work page, uh, people start to get a little bit confused usually when they when we're talking about some of the different terminology here in Scholar. So this year will hopefully kind of kind of clear some of that up. Uh, files are what you're putting into Scholar you see. And most people know I have a file and I want it to go into the repository. But those files get wrapped in something called a work. Uh, the work is basically what what holds the metadata for the file. Okay. So oh, it's a way so of single of describing word, multiple files. files. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. So sometimes you may have just one image and it kind of stands alone. It's still within a work though. You still have to, to provide some metadata for it. But if you have multiple images that are really all related and the metadata applies to all of them, you don't have to duplicate that across all the different uh, files that you're putting in. So uh, you can have common metadata for all, all of those files. And you can even have a work metadata that just uses an external link. So if you don't want to actually put the object in the Scholar, but just want to link to something that's already out there on the web, you can also do that as well. So, so works can contain different types okay. of things. Like a link external to PubMed? Yeah. A link to PubMed? Yeah, something that's already in another repository, mm -hmm. or maybe you're just pointing to uh, an article or something like that that's out there. And if you feel like the, uh, the location of uh, where it's at is, is stable, or maybe you have uh, a DOI or something like that for it, you can put that into Scholar and then people can reach it from, okay. 
from what there. are the restrictions of what you can put in or who, who's who's minding the store and, and I, I I say that because um, there are reasons why we need to mind the store. People could put a link to anything. Right. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. So we, we haven't had any complaints about something, uh, some copyrighted work being put into Scholar that needs to take down, although we will do that if we get um, a complaint okay. out there. That who, we, who, can, who can put things in this repository? Anyone who has a UC 6 plus 2 can log in and put stuff into the repository. Okay. My initial response to that is, Oh my God! Because we have students, right? Mm -hmm. We have, and I. Oh my. Okay. And, and yes. we, we did have concerns early on that you know students were going to be putting a backup of their music collection in the scholar and things like that. But, oh, yes. but we we have not had <laughs> we have not had any problems mm -hmm. with that. We'll edit that from the video. <laughs> <laughs> yes. so this, this is designed to be for scholarly. Right. professional Scholarly output of our university. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the the access is available down to students. Mm -hmm. And while they do scholarly work, they do all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. All right, okay. Yeah. I just I, all right, yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, um uh, last was it last week? No, no, last year. Last decade. Um last year uh, there was a meeting with our content group to look uh, to look again at scholar and uh, you know, the collection policies and all that. So at the back, we are actually working on some clearer guidelines. Because it is self-submission, you can't really stop people putting in. But we have to try and say it's scholarly, it's already published, it's available, it's you know, okay. copyright. So when you fill in the form, there are, there are those questions that ask you that. And most of the um, uh, copyright is something that you know, we have uh, awareness. But because this is open, there is no way for, uh, we find that it's very difficult to have a team of us look at every submission and say, yay, yeah, nay. Yeah. It, it is too hard. It is there are just too many. So we trust yeah. on professionalism, even with students to put in. Now, uh, it could be self-policing. We find something off and then we yank it out. Maybe you know. somebody will write an algorithm okay. to find everything. Yeah. That's so what they want. I, I, will, I will put aside that because mm -hmm. that will either happen or it won't. You'll yes. have to deal with it when it happens. Mm -hmm. Okay. But there, there are other things that I... I, I find potentially valuable on, on lots of different levels. For example, you're familiar with research directory. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you know that we have pri primarily we have focused on databases like PubMed and things like that, sort of backfilling that and then getting faculty to actually do something, mm -hmm. check that it's them or not them. But the theoretically, um, there could be a connection between mm -hmm. this and mm -hmm. and research directory mm -hmm. where you could actually get faculty to begin mm -hmm. thinking more like this is a good way to to, to uh, expand and make my my CV more robust. I could actually use research directory mm -hmm. as a way of having CV and then put things like posters or presentations mm -hmm. that are in my CV. I could actually put the real thing here and have a link, right. and so my my CV now is totally complete. It's not just a reference. It's not just Everything a line. There. It's the actual link to the document, the presentation. Yeah. So that so that's going on in my head. That is on the roadmap. So okay. so <laughs> I, I take it you guys are way ahead of me on this. Right? Yeah, it's on their website. Mm -hmm. actually. Yes. Okay. All right. Sorry. Mm -hmm. yep. The other the other is I'll catch up. <laughs> the, the the other is the thing that you. You, you put in here were data sets, mm -hmm. and that was both immensely intriguing and and really scary for me. So we have that we use, and it's mostly on, on this campus, um, a um, an application called Redcap that you may or may not be familiar with. That we use for a variety of things, but it houses it it, it houses extensive research databases. I had also um, uh, that there are there 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 are not is, is ma there's an opportunity to have a connection between Redcap and this, even if it's a link from here mm -hmm. into Redcap, mm -hmm. so that faculty can then use this as the catalog to find databases right. that exist yeah, in Redcap, 
is an opportunity to share because REDCap itself does not have that that capability. It was never designed that way, but it it opens up this opens up yeah. the possibility of sharing data across data sets without actually moving the data sets here. Right. Yeah, it becomes like uh, a so dashboard. Keep them secure, yeah. and people can choose to mm -hmm. to put the link in or not, but you can search them here to be able to see what databases exist. I assume you're you're there too, right? Mm -hmm. you're, yes. All right, you're, okay. This is under the uh, heading integrations. Okay. So we have integrations with research directory. Uh, you know, what are the integrations that make sense? Because if we, if we use um, Scholar as the archival repository, and this is, this is the technology side, uh, REDCap, uh, there are other uh, applications where Let's talk about data only, right? Data sets. There are applications out there that people use to manipulate the data. Right? We, 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 we pull in a NOAA data, we pull in demographics, yeah. and we do stuff there. That doesn't come into Scholar. That means you don't put that research data set into okay. Scholar and start moving it there. This is a, a preservation storage stuff. So you work on it. And then you say, right, it, it's, we have come up with the way we want to do it, and this is the data set we want to use in our article, and this article is related to that. Then you can start putting it here and say, right. okay, so the, finished finished product. Product, the finished product, you put it here. But then let's say somebody says, I want to see if it's scalable, if this person's article is valid. That one day they have to start working on it over there because Scholar doesn't have the, in the the application ability to say, well, we will let you go into this data set and manipulate and then do things with it. Yeah. You've got to go there and work it, a new article comes out, and then you put it back here. Yeah. And then that means there are now two different things that keep yeah. stored. So, so what I'm thinking, and, and you guys may be already there, but it, you know, I, it takes me a while to catch up, is that the, the advantage of REDCap is it's secure, and it's secured mm -hmm. under the owner of the database. Mm -hmm. And so he can permit the database to be here, which means the information about the database without the data Correct. can be is searchable. So you can find the database mm -hmm. right. and then connect to the owner mm -hmm. to decide. But yeah. then if the owner will allow you to have some or all of the actual data, it can be extracted from REDCap so that it's not manipulated in you. Mm -hmm. So it can be downloaded, right. yep. uh, but that's it. Still, never leaves the control of the owner of the data. That would be my concern about having databases here. We don't have databases inside but here. Data, okay. Data sets. All right, data sets. Data okay. All right. So, so um, th this linking, using it as a link, actually. Is, is the best of both worlds. It's the catalog, mm -hmm. and so you can search to find what's available yeah. and with, 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 without actually being able to get the raw data, mm -hmm. but you can request it if you know it's there and you can talk mm -hmm. to the owner. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this is a oh, good yeah. sort of yeah. la layer approach. Yeah. I like this yeah. a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It's potential. Is there. Okay, yeah. perfect. And then uh, works can be put into collections. Um, so if you want to group a number of works together, you can do that. And then collections themselves can be nested and nested. So just wanted to cover the terminology of file, work, and collection there because sometimes that's a, a little bit of a blocker when people first try to upload something to Scholar. They don't kind of understand that particular uh, layer they have there. I love this. <laughs> so I'll move through these uh, examples pretty quickly because you can go to Scholar at BC EDU and, and um, uh, kind of explore the stuff on your own. But uh, on this kind of slide, I'll just point out that there are a few images within this work here, and we have image viewers that allow people to pan around, zoom in and out of images, so you don't have to actually download the images to your yeah. computer if you don't want to, to be able to view them. But you can download them if you want to. Yeah. Okay. And yep. you said you had so many terabytes of mm -hmm. data already in the system. Mm -hmm. What if people start putting in a bunch of really large videos, is that going to really eat up well, what you have, eat up. your bandwidth? Do you have a limit? Well, <laughs> we don't now. We don't have a I can fit a terabyte in my pocket. Do you guys support videos? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, but if, but like, if all that we created, that would be um, like what? presentation, presentation, informational videos or something like that. Um, for a movie. Be. Or, you know, well, why would you put we've got a film school, right? So oh, students are going to be, right. Yeah. Um, but if it's uh, something that is already done 
and it's in perpetuity, you can right. put here. But if it's an ongoing teaching tool, yeah. I believe campus uses Kaltura, which is the streaming, you know, and that is better stored there. You can create, just like the data set okay. in red cap. <laughs> Kaltura, you, have, you can edit, you can put your whatever, update the right. slide with a typo, you do it there. Okay, so maybe a link to it. From yeah, the, yeah, from there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we, 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 do, we support any, any file type can be uploaded. Uh -huh. There are certain file types where we can actually extract some derivatives out of it and make it a little more easy for people to access them on here. And videos are, are, are a good example of that. If you upload a video into Scholar, the, the source video is stored there, but we also create a derivative that's a little bit lower quality that's allowed, that allows someone to actually watch the video right on Scholar without having to download the whole thing and play it locally. Okay. So who can access Scholar? Everybody. Everybody. Yeah. Okay. The, the world. Okay, so it's not six plus two folks. No. So you know we've got colleagues here right. from outside of. But you university. can limit. You can limit who gets access to. Okay. Yeah, but, but I'm I'm thinking for a lot of stuff that we are are doing. If we're looking at collaborations between people at other institutions, we've got Sue Schmidt from Xavier here. We've got people from UC mm -hmm. Health. Oh yeah, yeah. You, you know that that. A lot of things that we are doing or could potentially do. This is a, an, an easier way for us to share. Open access. Um, <laughs> open access. And if they had stuff and they wanted to put in here, they could certainly, we could work with them. We could put it in through us. Yep. Uh, as long as we have the connection. Be, we have to be an author on it. Yeah, there will be ideas. Yeah. Because, um, but I mean, if they wanted to share, they and they work through us. Mm -hmm. We're a conduit to getting things in there. Mm -hmm. yeah, if we collaborate with collaborate. Them, yeah. the material. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. 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 Okay. Um, this here is an example of a book that uh, Roger Tonkley here at UC decided to make open access and put in a scholar. So this is a PDF. It's not a very flashy page because we, we, we have a screenshot or a thumbnail of the first page of the PDF, but it's just a kind of a white page with some, some text on it. But you can hit that download PDF button and it's pull it down to your computer book. and get the entire book. But so, yeah, if your book has some nice cover art. <laughs> right, right. Um, yeah. One thing we have on the roadmap is putting in, like you saw the image viewer on the previous slide, we're, we're working on doing a PDF viewer so that people could actually page through the PDF right on the website without having to download it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. about this book, uh, Roger Chalkley is a uh, long-time professor of mathematics and he's, he came up with this whole algorithm. This book is actually available on Amazon for a few dollars. Uh, but he has, according to the agreement, he has the right to publish it anywhere else, put it on any other site. And it's just like, well, you know, what's a few dollars kind of thing? Is he really like a lump kind of a thing? So he said, why don't we just put the whole thing here, open access. Those who want to go to Amazon and buy, he gets a few, a few dollars. It's available open access. It's like, um, okay. interesting gentleman. He carries this entire PDF on a flash drive on his keychain. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you just upload it? Yeah, I would do the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> this is my book. Right. Better than yeah. pictures with your grandkids. Yeah. 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 So if this is open access. That's what I mean by that. Okay, cool. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. So if you're having trouble sleeping at night, pull yeah. all around your phone, Roger. pull pull down yeah. differential. Just the abstract is putting it. Yeah. 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 Um, here is an example of uh, Albert Sabin's uh, laboratory notebook uh -huh. that have been digitized. So this is something that's in in the Winkler Center. Yeah. Um, it's been digitized. From College of Medicine. Yeah. And, and in the VR downstairs. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, we, the, the entire collection is not quite finished yet. So the, the collection isn't published in Scholar, but a much of the uh, individual works are up there. So if you go to Scholar and search Sabin, you'll come across things like this. Uh, I think some of the uh, uh, thumbnails are still being generated for some of these things. But this is an example here of the metadata that would go along with with an item, and then they could download the PDF and actually look through this particular uh, section for polio and rhesus monkeys. Uh, again, it'd be, this would be a nice situation where the, the uh, PDF viewer would allow people to uh, just kind of thumb through it on their own, but for the moment they can just download it onto their machine. Um, this is an example of a collection. Uh, this is a, a bryophytes collection from Eric Tepe. Uh, you can see there, total items, 3,484. So that's 3,484 works in this one collection. Each work, I believe, has just one image. These are uh, note cards 
that have been digitized and then uh, cataloged and put into the uh, to the system. So um, the collection is just a way of kind of grouping all those works uh, together. Again, this one isn't that flashy, but uh, you can uh, go into a collection page. The owner can put up a, a background image and things like that and make it look a little bit nicer if they want to. Um, one of the things that, you know, th this is fantastic. Um, I, I don't, um, so I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I would go in here and I would find something, a presentation, a poster or something, and there should be sufficient information about that that I could theoretically cite it in a paper or something I was working. I, you know, once I get outside of journal articles and books, my ability to understand how to cite things gets really small. Yes. So is there a mechanism that would help us know how to cite things from here? We do. Um, we have that that particular feature disabled at the moment. There, there's a way that you can generate citations. Um, Perfect. But it's disabled at the moment because we were having a little bit of a trouble with uh, preserving author order on things. And we don't want people citing oh. something with authors in the wrong order. <laughs> so that's not being displayed on the work pages right now. But um, okay. But once that issue is, is resolved, All right. then, then those, those links will come back. And each of this is a DOI, right? Um, people can choose to create, oh, create, create a DOI. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Perfect. That solves a good segue into the slide here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is an example of a, of a page you'll see if you actually want to add content into Scholar. So once you log in, um, there's no creating an account on Scholar. If you have a 6 plus 2, it'll let you write in. Um, it's just the first time you log in, it kind of gener generates an account in the background for you. Um, and then it will ask, when you go to create a work, it will ask you what type of work it is. There's like seven different choices. This one here happens to be for a document, but we also have a generic work type, which if nothing really fits, you can choose generic work. And um, this page, uh, it's just a screenshot so I can't scroll down on it, but on this page you have a long list of metadata items that you can choose to fill out. The first half dozen are required, things like title, the creator, uh, college, department, and your college and department and name should automatically be pulled in based on your login. So we get that stuff through UC Central Identification System. So those things get pre-filled pre out for you. Um, and then on these other tabs that you see up here, this is the metadata tab. We also have a DOI tab. So if you want to create a digital object identifier for your work, you can do that. And that guarantees that if down the road, Scholar, uh, the URL for Scholar changes or we move it into new software and the, and the paths change for it. You can track it. Those DOIs will always bring you back to that. that the social security work. number for your article. That's perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's perfect. Um, the files tab is where you would actually upload your files. You can pull in multiple files at once if you want to. So if that work has 100 files associated with it, you can upload them all okay. at once. Do you have to have metadata for each file? You, okay. yeah. Uh, a work is, if you're putting something in the Scholar, a work is absolutely required. So you do have to put in some basic metadata. Right. For so the metadata is for the work, not for the file per se. Well, it, it, it describes the files. Okay. So, right. Right. That's right. Yeah, the, the work is just there to help kind of encapsulate the files and describe them. Okay. Um, relationships is where you could uh, add this work to an existing collection if you wanted to. And then we have a sharing tab where if um, if you wanted to put something into Scholar and uh, make it private, but allow someone else to see it, maybe you're collaborating on creating the metadata and stuff for it, you can add those people as an editor or a viewer on it. And even though you haven't granted access to the world for it, you can collaborate on some other people at UC with it if, uh, if you're kind of, it's kind of like a, a co-created a work or something like that. And then on the right-hand side, you see the vis visibility options there. The default is open access. If, if you leave it set to that, then once you save this, anyone in the world can go to scholar.ec.edu and access it. We also have a University of Cincinnati option, which means that you have to be logged in to be able to see this work. Okay. And since can you change that? Is the other? Uh, yes. Yes. So if if uh, if you select the University of Cincinnati option, you're basically saying anyone who has a UC six plus two can get to this, but no one else. So if it's something you want to limit to just the UC community, you have that option. So if I were coming in from the outside mm -hmm. and I were searching this, mm -hmm. would it pull up but not allow me to see things from the University of Cincinnati? 
Yeah. Um, or, or, you know, or, or would they, I not even they, be able to find it in the search? They do not show up in the search. Okay. All right. That's good. There know. are ways around that, though. Um, <laughs> the, the visibility options can yes. also be set individually on files. So you could make your work open access while making some or all of your files private or access only. only. Okay. I see. So that they can discover it, but they may not be able to actually get to some of the files. Uh, they could potentially okay. contact you yeah. and request yeah. access. Yeah. Yeah. I'll skip and mark it for a second. Private just means only you can see it. Okay. Or if you individually share it with someone else, they can see it as well. Embargo is there uh, so that you, uh, you can set a date that it will automatically be set from private to open access or private to UC only if you want to. And that could be two years down the road, a month down the road. Let's say you have something that's going to be published in a journal or something like that, and you can't make it available on Scholar until it gets published, or maybe two years after it's been published. You can set an embargo date, forget about it, and when that date hits, it will automatically switch to open access. So. Um, and then that below that, the on behalf of, we have uh, proxy users in Scholar. So you could set up someone to be your proxy and add stuff on your behalf. So we have professors who work with uh, like a grad student to put their stuff in the scholar and when the grad student does that for them and chooses on behalf of the faculty member, um, they show up in scholar just as if the faculty member had done it themselves. And then they can remove proxy access to that person down okay. if they want to. Okay, okay so that's a, a, a quick view of uh, the, the works and the collections and how you might add something in. Um, if we had another hour, I would demonstrate all these other features, but, but we'll, 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 just, we'll just touch on, on uh, these briefly. File versioning means that if you put something into Scholar and then let's say it, uh, it changes down the road, maybe it's an updated presentation or um, you had to make some, uh, fix some spelling mistakes in the document or something like that, you can re-upload a new version of it and it replaces the previous one but that previous one remains in the background, in the repository preserved, and if you ever need to get to that original copy of it, you can get to it. So once it goes into Scholar, unless you actually delete it, it's still there some way, and you can, you can either revert back to the previous version or at least access it if you, if you need to. Uh, there are batch load, upload options for users, so if you have 100 different files that should all go in 100 different works, you can do that all in one step in Scholar and then swing back around and tweak the, the metadata for each of those works. Uh, we have cloud upload options. Right now, uh, in production, we just have a uh, box. So you, if you have items sitting on box, you can uh, pull those directly into Scholar. In the next update of Scholar coming out in February, you'll also have the option for Google Drive and for um, Dropbox. Those are two we used to have in the past, but those services radically changed their APIs and it broke things. So we had to fix them, and now they're coming back. Uh, the one missing from there is OneDrive, which is important because <laughs> UC is, uses that a lot now. Um, so that'll be following after those. Uh, we will be able to offload stuff directly from your OneDrive. So if you have a really huge data set sitting on a cloud provider, you don't have to download it to your computer and then upload it to use Scholar UC. You can do it directly. Uh, there's automatic virus scanning, so anytime you upload something to Scholar, it, it uh, scans for viruses in the background and will alert you if it finds one, and you will not let it go into the repository if it, if it finds it there. So it's a way of keeping our, our repository uh, uh, protected. And then we have what are called uh, fixity checks. Um, so when you put something into Scholar, we create a, uh, a fingerprint for that, that file that basically um, identifies if, that the, the file is unchanged. So that uh, anytime you try to generate that fingerprint, it should always come back the same if the file is exactly the same as it is. Uh, so we regularly scan the stuff that's in Scholar, regenerate the fingerprints, and then match that up with the original fingerprints to make sure that there hasn't been any corruption. Corruption can happen on the hard drive where things are stored. Um, there's lots of different ways something can happen. Mm -hmm. But um, those are there to help make sure that uh, the stuff that's actually in Scholar is exactly the way it is when someone put it in, even a year, hundred years down the road. Um, so you know that uh, you don't uh, find out after many years that it's corrupted and the backups have all been lost and we can't restore it. Yeah. And then the others we already kind of touched on, the visibility options, proxy users, sharing with others. You saw the image viewer and 
DOIs are there. You can, it's an option to create the DOIs, um, but um, uh, once you do, you have a permanent link that will always bring you back to that particular page in Scholar where that, where that work is. So that's good if you need to put something into a, uh, a print publication or something like that where you won't be able to come back and fix the link down the road. Okay. Um, and this just talks a little bit about the background, the underlying technology uh, within Scholar. Uh, Scholar itself is an open source application. The source code is out there and available for anyone to take and use. Uh, the, license, the open source license we use for it means that um, uh, people can use it, but they couldn't put it into a commercial application and charge money for it. But really, if, if another institution thought that they wanted to use our Scholar code for something, they could download it, change up the colors and the name on it, and call it their, their uh, institutions of store, institutional repository. So the source code's up there on, on GitHub, which is kind of a, a collaboration area for, for code where people want to share and, and work together on it. And then um, uh, Scholar is built on top of something called the Canberra Project. So we actually collaborate with other uh, institutions uh, uh, to generate the underlying core code for uh, the institutional repository. So these are a bunch of institutions like um, uh, Princeton, Stanford, Yale, Duke, who all got together and decided to work to uh, work as a team to build this core preservation software. So uh, we're one of the partner in institutions. We help work on the core software, but then we also take that core software and customize it and make it into Scholar EC. So the idea is each of these institutions is building on top of a core and making it their own. Uh, and uh, we just start, we just uh, were awarded a $1 million grant uh, to the San Vero organization to enhance the project, uh, things like analytics and making it easy, even easier to put really large uh, amounts of content in the Scholar. And all of that is built on yet another piece of software out there called Fedora Commons, and that's where the actual preservation happens. That's just the, the piece that actually uh, uh, creates creates the fingerprints, creates the file versioning, and just makes, makes sure that everything in there is safe and preserved and unchanged. So we work, we collaborate with the Fedora Commons people to help make their software better, and then um, their software gets used in our project. So there's a lot of back and forth there. It's kind of a symbiotic uh, relationship between those, those two different groups. So we don't develop the software in Fedora Commons, but we, do, we make heavy, heavy use of it. Has there been any discussion? Since it, it seems like there's sort of a coalition of of universities mm -hmm. that have taken this, built it, and sort of made it available, so certainly are using it. That would create sort of a a, a mega repository across these institutions where people signing on from one would have access to a some kind of chivalrous login, because uh, I, I mean, it sounds like the opportunity is there. Well, and we're actually making use of an opportunity like that um, in an upcoming project mm -hmm. where um, it's not content that isn't scholar right now, this is library-owned content, so it, 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 it's in another, uh, it's going to go into another repository, but we're going to use the Sam Vera framework as a way of linking um, uh, modern Greek journals from several different institutions all into one single discoverable interface. Okay, so it sounds like sort of a, an Ohio link kind of model. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. But if you think of an institutional repository, the, the word is institutional. So UCLA has one for UCLA scholarly products. Yeah. Princeton has one. We have one for our scholarly products. Yeah. We, I don't think there's a website out there that says scholarly products from all universities mm -hmm. try to link. <laughs> it's, it's, it's too tremendous. And as a dispute, we have a big bunch. It's yeah. like, uh, the generic term is an institutional repository. It is based on the institution. Yeah. We are trying to save the institution's memory, the institution. Well, you, wouldn't, yeah. you, you wouldn't be giving that up by, no. by having a collaboration. Mm -hmm. and, and the other thing is that while institutions are physically and, mm -hmm. and, and, and technologically fixed, faculty are not. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they mm -hmm. move around. Oh, they move around. around. Oh, yes. and, mm -hmm. and so, you know, it would be nice to know for faculty. Yeah. Yeah. If, you, if I went to one of these, my I don't have to actually move all of my stuff. It's still, you know, it's still there. And UC doesn't lose it because it was done when I was at UC. Mm -hmm. 
but you know I've been to five different institutions mm -hmm. and I would like to know that that it, it's out there and it's accessible. I think most of us will go to Google search and it's in Google yeah. Scholar. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. the repository. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and we, we do have an integration <laughs> with um, with Orchid. Familiar with oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So right now, the only thing with, with Scholar is that you can you can link your Orchid ID into your profile so that it's there. But a future enhancement down the road will probably allow Scholar to be able to, if you put something to Scholar, it can update your Orchid account or yeah. or or by, vice versa. You can pull stuff from Orchid. Yeah. Essentially. Well, that yeah, that was the other thing that I was thinking of that that as faculty move. The thing that we typically use to a unique identifier is institution specific. But if they move to another institution, they become another person. Because right. and right. so Orchid really was meant to 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 cover that eventuality. Mm -hmm. And so that allows you to be you wherever you are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wherever you go, oh, there you are. Mm -hmm. And I know the research directory also uses Orc ID. That's why um, we are integrating with uh, we don't have another hour. Okay. Okay. Kind of the last. Yeah. The last, last okay. Part. Sorry. Yeah. This okay. is the best slide. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, again, back about five years ago, the notion of there, there was always been a research directory. The research directory is faculty profiles. It's there for your RPT. You know, you put all your things there. All your publication over the years, like you know, I'm publishing something next semester, and then it goes inside there. But um, the, re the research directory does not really store your articles. That was never meant to be. It was meant to cite where you have published this yeah. uh, right. over time. You have that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the idea is that you know, going forward, to provide a button in the research directory, mm -hmm. as you then say, you know, I published this article two months ago, and you put there the uh, ability to say, I also want to upload this article to Scholar. Yes. So the background integration where we work on that, yes. then it becomes. Well, if you put a button there, well, everybody starts to put PubMed and suddenly we get a duplication. So we need to yeah. work a little bit behind the scenes to look at um, policies, uh, some constraints or some limitations. What is it we're trying to do? Because, you know, uh, uh, we also have to put a word that says that make sure that we work in, in a common, creative commons license, that if you were to allow this, your article to be uploaded, there's no restrictions on it because of open access. So there are these things you have to do a bit more, um, you know, uh, teaching a, a little checklist for folks. So we are working on that, but it's not quite there yet. But okay. right now, that, but that is the plan because people, faculty especially, goes to research directory first. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You yeah. you you don't go to your preserve. You don't think about that. You're looking at yeah. the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. One one thing okay. I want to just add real quick is for our National Cancer Institute designation, we are going to have to track all of our cancer members' publications and yes. show yes. all of that. So mm -hmm. at some point, mm -hmm. I need a conversation sure. with yeah. you all yeah. on, on yeah. how we can best do that. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, right. So this this is the, and this is what we're trying to create a connected um, uh, uh, connecting all the different parts of research at UC. So the best way we call it was the hub. And it, it, it starts on publishing and scholarship and research and funding, all of these components that makes up the research hub at, at the university. Uh, so some common platform which right now is still siloed. So there's research directory, there's us, there's publishing. But they're all dotted line connections. Yeah. So hopefully, uh, this was developed as this hub notion was developed a few years ago. And we've been updating, you know, this part here is research director, but that part, e-learning researcher services is uh, Tiffany, that her group comes under that hub. So as, a, as an environment, an ecosystem, is the way to put this, so that faculty don't feel that they're left out there, who do we contact? It is this hub. Great. This is fantastic. I, I amazing? respect, you know, that there are probably a few more mm -hmm. spokes could be in, yeah. in there, and yeah. um, but but connecting them all is something we've been trying to do for a long time because we know we're collecting a huge amount of data, and, and that there's no easy way to maneuver from one to another, pull mm -hmm. things from one to another. But we know it's there, mm -hmm. and so we often just recreate it, usually poorly, 
And then you've got two of the same pieces of data that could be tracking down saying they, this could change, but this did. And all of that gets really hard for us who are trying to do metrics and looking at outcomes and looking at what it is we're doing. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. we're never sure where the gold standard is for the data. Right. From the library's point of view, uh, the latest investigation we are doing as a library, um, and given the technology trends these days, right, you've got an application to do research, an application to manipulate data. What are we all doing is research. So the term uh, in the industry now is a research platform. It's like a platform, starting mm -hmm. from point A to the very okay. end, right? Uh, and we are look, and several vendors have got some really good ones, and we are actually uh, starting to look at those as a platform to somehow, hopefully, seamlessly connect a repository to, you know, research directory to how to connect to all of this, so that you know our faculty don't feel like, where do we do next? So you know, even within the the, the, the uh, between uh, central IT and us, we are trying to find a simpler way of doing it. Okay. But at the moment, you know, we're just hoping that uh, things happen. This is enormously mm -hmm. helpful because mm -hmm. certainly a lot of people around this room, yes. we're in this space and we're right. constantly right. trying to, right. do we build this, do we buy this, mm -hmm. do we pull this in and that in, mm -hmm. and, and we probably only need to do it once. Right. We probably do not need to do it 15 times, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, and, and yet, one, we don't know who the others are, oh, Right. and two is, Everybody's building it for their little needs, mm -hmm. and, and and so we're expending huge amounts of resources, mm -hmm. uh, and, and we're recreating the same stuff over and over again. This yeah. is fantastic. Yeah. That's great. Thank yeah. you very Thank much. You. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Feel free to contact us if yeah. you have questions. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's also there's also a uh, a contact form right on Scholar at UC okay. that will reach us. You could choose yeah. to use that. Oh, great. Like, oh yes. You, we will be in contact. I will be passing this on to mm -hmm. a number of people that will want to talk to you. Yes. Let me uh, okay. give Thank you, you some additional. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. That was fantastic. Yeah. I will pass these out. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody on the phone. Yeah. Thank you. I, I Bye. Hope Thank you. Useful. This um, certainly. We will be following up on some of these things. Thank you, everybody. It's a university effort, enterprise uh, level. So yeah.